Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. My name is Patrick Moran. Thank you very much, as always, for watching, for listening, following, for subscribing. Appreciate you very much. Uh, we are recording this on a Saturday afternoon, live from the first ever Mafia Con, and I am joined, if you can watch the video right now, you can see him on the screen. Very special guest, good friend of mine, from the athletic, Tim Graham. What's going on, Tim? You All his resplendent glory. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Um, this is a cool event. So I was poking my head in there, a little warm. That's my only criticism, but it is comfortably yeah. busy here, meaning the play that sold out, sold out all their tickets. Yes. They probably could have sold more if they wanted to. Sure. But it is buzzing. And uh, but you can still move around and get to see everybody and visit and talk and some Bills players here and shout out to our guy Del Reed, the creator of this event, right there. A little wave to him. Um, yeah, Where this is he? he just walked past us, oh. walked right in. Oh, I was too busy. <laughs> I was too busy loving myself You're on in. camera. <laughs> <laughs> this is um all right. So quick little story before we get into it. Some Bills talking when I'll come to catch up with you a little bit. There's Del. Um, this has been going on inside all day. If nothing else, we're creative. And it was hot in there. And we're too hot. We're kind of getting up there in age, dude. We're a little uncomfortable in there. And a little moist. A little bit. A little like bit. Can, a little loud, too. As soon as you walk into yeah. the room, you can feel it in your nostrils. <laughs> there was no smell. Yeah. It didn't stink. But right, you, could, you could smell the humidity. So we started, well, at least I started snooping around. I'm like, how can I find a way to get us outside? So if nothing else, we're innovative. There's been a bunch of podcasts today. It's nice out here. Only it's beautiful actually out. And we're in some shade. Shout out, by the way, Just Pizza. Providing even more shade with the truck um behind us. Yeah, but this free is free advertising. A, free advertising. This is a, a great event. Keon Coleman, as we're recording this right now, Keon Coleman is actually signing for fans. He's winding down. Cole Bishop's coming up next. But um, there was literally before you got here too, there was literally a line around the corner to uh for people to get in to see and meet Keon Coleman. And I'll tell you what, I haven't had much interaction with him to this point. I don't know if you've had a chance to to talk with him yet since he's uh got drafted to Buffalo, but seems like a really genuine guy. Like he seems like who he is doesn't seem like an act. Like I that, haven't been around him much more than you have. Yes, I've been at practices and news conferences and you know all that type of stuff, but everything that he's done has pretty much been broadcast out there to everybody. So yeah. the fans have seen pretty much every ever interview that he's done. And um, my only thing, the cynic in me, is are the expectations too high? I think obviously yeah. Bills fans fall in love easily, like a lot of fans do. But I think Bills fans maybe a little more. And sure. with how Stephon Diggs left, yeah. Everybody needs Keon Coleman to be the guy. I mean, he literally painted over, not him personally, but on Hurdle Avenue. They yeah, literally painted over that. Stephon Diggs with Keon Coleman yeah. putting the yellow jacket on the mural uh, of him standing next to Josh Allen downtown. Symbolism. Uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to supplant Stefan Diggs than that. For sure. I want to talk about Stefan too, in a, a few minutes. I want to get a couple takes from you. Again, going back to this event, though, being so hot inside, but kind of comfortable now outside, at least in some shape. Are you a summer guy? Like, what, what's your what's no. your season? Well, like, yeah, just four yeah. seasons in guy. Buffalo. Summer way better. Uh, summer's probably number two, but I sweat. Yeah. I am. I've always been that way. I sweat so much as a kid that my mom used to give me salt pills for when I oh, was really? playing baseball, playing football, especially two-a-day practices. Everything's just drenched. And I am just always uncomfortable in the heat. I love the fall. I love it cool out. Yeah. I'm the type of guy who would rather, uh, you know, wear a, I'll wear a fleece in the middle of winter. Just mm -hmm. that's all I need. Just give me a fleece. Yeah. I love the fresh air. It makes you feel alive. I like that. I but feel, uh, look, I, I'll take this over shoveling snow. Sure. And I feel like a hypocrite because I'm a summer guy. I always talk about summer and then I complain when it's hot and I'm out here. 
having us guy old people out here getting out some shade. I gotta throw I'm gonna throw my wife under the bus a little bit too. She wasn't here before you got here. She left. She came here with me, even put on a blue Buffalo or a talking Buffalo t shirt, support the cause here. And then she bounced like about 15, 20 Couldn't minutes in. No, she's too hot. She walked in a little bit, walked around, Understood. saw everything she needed to see. Understood. I got here early because I was helping set up for a previous show. And she's like, yo, so I have pick a, you up. I have, I'm, it's counterintuitive or it sounds counterintuitive. I'm wearing pants here uh, because you say, <laughs> Tim, you don't like it hot. Why would you be wearing pants? The reason is because I don't go outside in the summer <laughs> and I didn't want uh, people to have to wear sunglasses in my presence. Uh, even inside, uh, I'm <laughs> pale. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm covering it. But, yeah, it's not the most. Uh, but it is comfortable now. Now we've got a little bit of shade. Yeah. This is actually beautiful. Yeah, man. I don't sit out in the backyard. I'm not a sun worshiper, none of that mm. stuff. Give me shade, a air conditioning. I'm happy. Yeah, and you know what? I don't want to sound like a whiner. This event that Del Reed has put together, the first one ever, this has been great. There's vendors inside. There's food. There's there's beer. Buffalo Bills players are currently signing right now. Can I, without giving anything away specifically, there there's a player here that you've recently worked on a, a, yeah. a story for that I'm not going to get into that. But no, you can. I, 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 in fact, I'm on zero sleep. I have a that hot, is true too. You're a gamer, I, dude. Okay, so this is a Bills Mafia Pilsner, mm -hmm. or how are they calling it? Let me. The Mafia Con Pilsner. I don't want to say because you say you put bills in there that yeah, that, that right. uh, suggests that there's a official license or anything like that. Right. This is called Mafia Con Pilsner. It is underneath my hot Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> you are on more no sponsored sleep too. content. So yeah, I'm on no sleep because I was up uh, on deadline filing a Terrell Bernard uh, deep dive origin mm -hmm. story story in which I went down to Laporte, Texas. Uh, his hometown down in suburban uh, oh, really? Houston. Uh, spent some time with him down there. Uh, interviewed uh, his high school coach, some of his college people, oh, wow. uh, his fiance, uh, to get to know who uh, a player who I think is the future of this Bills defense. And yes, there are a lot of important players on on the roster. Ed Oliver, Rasul Douglas, Taron Johnson, Matt Milano, all mm -hmm. these guys. But in talking, and particularly with Sean McDermott. Uh, there's some comments in there from Sean McDermott in which you get the sense that this guy is a favorite of this organization. Yeah. He'll be a captain this year, uh, especially be at the position that he plays. Uh, and so I felt it was time to tell this man's story because he was such a surprise at the beginning of the season to even get the job without having any preseason experience. Yeah. He had never worn the green dot until the opener yeah. uh, against the Jets. But everybody was so stunned about how the season began and what's wrong with Josh Allen and this, that, and the other, that by the time Terrell Bernard had taken hold, there were so many other storylines, and I just don't think he ever got his just due. So I that was, was a objective of mine. I have a couple other big features coming uh, on two other players the, that'll run during training camp. But Terrell Bernard, I talked to my bosses. I said, I want to go to his hometown, give him the whole origin story treatment. And uh, they were absolutely, and uh, I think the story turned out pretty well. I'm looking forward to seeing that or reading it. And by the way, Terrell Bernard, I didn't want, again, I was not going to so, be yeah. the one to give it away. So he was here. He was here. Yeah, he was you just missed him. I missed him. Yeah. Um, I, I've pestered him enough yeah. uh, because <laughs> these stories, what happens, well, you know, guys, then, you know, you get the phone number and you get this person's phone number and then I'm bugging him for this and this little detail. Because when I tell a story, especially when we're talking about an origin story, right. I want everything to be precise because people generally will refer to these types of stories over time. Five years from now, somebody might be doing a a, a story or want to know something about Terrell Bernard and be reading this story. Um, and so, I, again, you are you always want to be right no matter what. But when you're telling a, a story that I think it has an archival uh, nature to it, you know, I, I, I pester these guys. And... Uh, Sometimes they regret giving me the access. I'll tell you something about Terrell Bernard. Let's just pretend MafiaCon 2023 existed last year. This is the first year, but let's say 12 months ago, this was going on right now, days before Bill's training camp. And we were going to, you know, I'm going to eventually, I'm going to catch up with you something on the show, and then we're going to kind of turn it to some Bill stuff. Asking you about players you're going to keep your eye on, things like that. I would say in most people's wildest expectations, Terrell Bernard not just becoming the starter, 
but emerging as a, a star player on this team was something that very few people seen because all season long, Tremaine Emmons leaves. Right. So, yeah, that's where it goes deeper, Pat, is yeah. because that was the number one question heading Easily. into the, or not just into the training camp, the entire offseason. How are they going to replace right. Tremaine Evans? Maybe number two was uh, can Spencer Brown handle right tackle? But yep. there were very few questions regarding the Bills, and Tremaine Edmonds's replacement was probably one, two, you know, however you want. It was that critical. And Terrell Bernard comes out of nowhere because he has the hamstring injury in training camp, plays none of the preseason right. games. A.J. Klein plays all three games. Balin Specter plays all three Dodson. games. Terrell Dodson plays all three games. Dorian Williams is a rookie. People are saying maybe he even has a shot at the mm -hmm. job and, in fact, led the Bills in tackles yeah. uh, throughout the preseason. And then that Monday or whatever it was when it was announced, everybody's kind of like, wow, because yep. we didn't see him. He, first, didn't, he, barely, he didn't even audition. My first thought was he didn't win the job. Dotson lost it. That was my mindset yeah. at the time. And all offseason long, the Bills are adding players. The Bills signed a lot of guys last year. Like, well, what was the linebacker? But then I also, he gets the draft time. Like, where's the linebacker in the first or second yeah. round? Jack Campbell was a guy that kept coming up, you know, the Jermaine Evans. Oh, how about this? Christian Kirksey. Yeah. Gets signed, and everybody assumes, well, he's the guy. Yeah, he's Because they're going to onboard him. They got him on the practice squad. He'll learn, and by week two, he'll be the guy. And he, what happened? He lasted three weeks because he got a look at Terrell Bernard and was like, uh, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> this guy's in." It yeah. was, and, it was, uh, it was, it was a shocker for sure. You now so doing feature writing, but you still dabble with beat reporting when you have to with you know with the yeah. athletic. But for the most part, you're not a beat reporter anymore after doing it for a long time. When it comes to the off season, like what's the difference for you in terms of being a beat reporter as opposed? to being a storyteller more of what yeah, you are now. Yeah, this was an unusual offseason. I didn't get to do my job as much because uh, Joe Biscaglio was away. Uh, he had uh, much-deserved time sure. uh, owed. And uh, so I was doing some of that and then trying to still take care of uh, the stories uh, that I had on my checklist. And uh, But, yeah, normally that's, you know, Joe handles that. He's big into the X's and the O's, uh, what every injury means to the depth chart roster projections, the draft, all that type of stuff. I yeah, I kind of really like to be the storyteller. And when when it is necessary to set the the tone or, you know, with a column or right. an opinion piece, I generally, I'm not a huge opinion guy. I've never really been, um, but uh, I'm more of an analysis with, I would say, sourced uh, analysis along with sourced opinion, meaning mm -hmm. I'm not just – Pulling it off the top of my head. I'm talking with the people who are giving me insight uh, about who, what the decision makers are truly thinking. All right. When we're here at an event like Mafia Con, I always I think it's cool to see you walking around and, you know, people are coming up to you saying, hey, oh, Tim, I love it. It's, my it name is my and I know you. And I can tell you're not being disingenuous. Who I know that you genuinely it's like that. But it's a well-honed act. Well, you do it well, man. But people know you doing that being the yeah. writer obviously i do as well but me personally i am a podcast guy too and i've really come to enjoy your show that you do with jono over the last couple of years Thank for you. sure what i like about your show is well i like a lot of things but you get different guests on first of all you don't have a guest every week sometimes it's you and jonah but when you right. do have guests they tend to be more on that unique side people with all due respect to, you know, the Buffalo media people out there, and I love them, man. Guys like Perino and Sal and Matt, yeah. those guys are great guys, and, and I love and respect those guys, but they're always doing everybody's shows. You, you see them everywhere. When you have guests on your show, they're usually somebody who you're not really seeing much, if at all, on other shows. Yeah. You know, Nick Pakai. Which I had to write it down. Well, by the way, too, Matt Molson. It, it was not all that long that ago. That was a surprise, you know, to get Matt Molson because – there's a, a, a kid, a neighbor, a neighbor. He actually used to babysit my kids, uh, and he did a challenge at an Arizona Diamondbacks game earlier in the baseball season, nine beers, nine hot dogs, and nine innings. Oof. And the nine, nine, and nine challenge, and it blew up on – it went viral. Like, he had a million impressions. I think Barstool wow. picked it up. And said, but his, 
his name, and I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what it is, but I think it's Matt Molson Canadian or something. It's just a play on it was a beer mm-hmm. themed thing, and I got Matt Molson to come on, and he couldn't really pull it off with a straight face, but he was going to confront Patrick Tierney's the name of the kid, uh, young man. Uh, and was going to confront him about using his name for such deplorable purposes. <laughs> and Molson couldn't pull it. He had also, I think he was in his, at the 19th hole himself. Oh, and he okay. was calling in. And it was, a great, it was a great episode. And one of the most watched because Matt Molson talked about his thoughts on the Sabres yeah. at the time when people were wondering what some people outside the organization who used to be in it think. But anyways. No, that was a good get. And then recently, I said, well, you know how we all put our tweets when we got our shows, you know. Josh Mankiewicz from uh, Dateline NBC has been a, a guest. Yes. We talked about storytelling. Just, what was it, last week, two weeks ago, Maury Povich. All right, so I'm on Twitter, and I read Maury Povich on your show. I'm like, wait, wait, what? Yeah, what? Why Talk not? about, that's what I'm talking about, though. When, if you're, <laughs> you're going to have a guest on, have a unique guest. How did you, How did, for people who haven't seen it, first of all, go watch it or listen to it, but. How in the world did you end up getting Maury Povich on Tim Graham and Friends? So I have a weird writing process, and I don't think it, this part of it is weird. I just did it. In fact, I'm on zero sleep because when I write a big feature, I tend to get started, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. I like everybody at home to either be in bed or accounted for in their rooms. You know, whatever. My kids are old enough. Uh, you know, they stay up late. But. I need the house to be kind of quiet, and that's when I get started, and I write throughout the night. And you, a lot of times what I'll do is I have a game on. You know, I have a TV on my desk, and I'll have uh, a game, and then you get into the West Coast games, whether it's basketball or hockey or baseball. And then I found myself, when the West Coast games were over, because I can never get done before those are done, uh, before they, before they, are, uh, they conclude, uh, I found myself putting on old episodes of Maury that I have on my DVR. <laughs> and I started to wonder why that is. And so I came to the conclusion that it's because Maury is a sports show because it's a competition. There's a crowd there in an arena type setting. There's an, an innings kind of structure where the one, one, the, somebody gets first ups and then somebody else comes up. I never gets thought second, of it second, that way. Gets there at bats. Yeah. And in the end, there's a conclusion, whether it's, the person being the father or not, or the <laughs> DNA test, or you know, sometimes it's whatever troubled teens uh, go to a boot camp or scared straight, um, formulaic, but it is a sports uh, aesthetic almost. And so I thought to myself, this was last summer. I was like, I want uh, Maury Povich's father, by the way, Shirley Povich, legendary, legendary sports writer, maybe top five all time or Mount, Mount mm. Rushmore type guy of, of sports writers with Grantland Rice and Red Smith and all this guys. covered not only worked right up until the uh, the end. I think he was 94 when he died, covered Lou Gehrig's farewell speech and Cal Ripken breaking Lou Gehrig's record, both in person, wow. by the way, not wow. like off TV or anything. Wow. So anyway, surely public. So I wanted to, I reached out almost on a fishing expedition, went online Maury Povich owns a newspaper in Montana where he retired called the Flathead Beacon. And I went to the Flathead Beacon, contact us, blind email saying, I don't even know what I'm looking for here, but I watch Maury as part of my writing process and I want to maybe understand why and maybe I want to do a story on it. Go to bed after I sent that email late at night, woke up. By the time I woke up the next morning, there was a call in my voicemail, it was Maury Povich himself oh, wow. calling back Damn. to say, I don't know what planet you're on or where this comes from, but now you got me thinking. And yeah. you're right. And so we had a long, we had a talk. The story never came of it, but we began a text relationship, I guess. Mm-hmm. Incredibly nice guy. Like you wouldn't like zero shred of arrogance or, right. you know, I think soup just a, uh, regular dude who I think knows that he's lived a charmed life. And um, I just asked, I said, would you be willing to do a podcast and talk about your show as a, as a as sports program and your father's influence on your life? And, uh, and he said, sure. And he was on for an hour, sat with us for an hour, got off the golf course up in Montana and sat down with Jonah and I for uh, Jonah and me for, uh, for an hour. That's, a mensch. That's wild. I'll tell you what too. let that be a, my takeaway from that, too, let it be a little lesson for people out there who, whether you want to be a writer or podcast or broadcast, or whatever, sometimes just 
Even Tim Graham, just shoot your shot. You know, you didn't have an in necessarily. No. Just took a stab at something and ended up ultimately coming to it uh, is amazing come to fruition. There are people who are actually their job is to respond to journalists, yeah. media relations people, PR people, uh, attorneys. You know, all the different gatekeepers that we have in our profession, mm -hmm. um, and they wouldn't. They, it, it's common. Maybe even. More often than not, you won't even get a response when you reach out. That Maury po uh, that I sent a blind email <laughs> and somebody like Maury Povich, who is a broadcasting legend, for whatever you think about the show, mm -hmm. but this man is, you know, had an incredible life and an incredible career, uh, just to get back to me, just to call me. Didn't even send an email saying or, or no, no awesome. PR person. It's just Maury himself. That, that, that's, that's just nuts. How do you do you have a formula for? When you're going to write a, a long feature, do you have like any kind of specific formula? Like, how do you formulate a story? What gives you the idea? Where do you come up with your premise to do some of these great stories that you've been you writing know, for years I, now? I probably do have a formula. Um, I don't know that I know what it is, but I'm sure that I rely on things. And that's probably not great. You know, you want to think that you take a fresh approach to every story. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure after 30 years of doing this that I, I fall back on habits that have served me well. Um you know, what I like to do, the hardest thing to come up with on any story is the lead. You know, it's getting started. It's hooking the reader. And what I think that the, my approach is as research intensive as my, uh, my approach is, I talk to probably too many people that through that process, I should come up with multiple options for how I want to start a story. Now, sometimes it hits you over the head with a hammer and it's no doubt, but you should also have like, a, okay, but this could have been a lead or this is, or, or maybe uh, even to the point where, geez, I have two leads and I don't know it. So what I do is I like to break the story up. Why can't I have multiple leads? Right. And so that's what I like to do. So I segment my stories and I have leads. Uh, I'll put down on a pad and I, and I flesh out each lead. Each It's almost like stories with multiple little stories within the bigger context of the story. And that also helps me jump from one thing to another a little bit more easily. Hey, you got a break here. You know, so different, you know, uh, news outlets do it differently. The athletics got the long line with the A in the middle to let mm -hmm. you know that it's like a new chapter. And you can, that one's done. Now we're starting another. And when you're doing long form, that to me is kind of, is liberating. Um, but it takes a, these stories take a long time to write. That, I mean, I always exactly. think when I sit down, oh, this I can knock this out in three, four hours. And lo how long is it? How long? I mean, I know it varies. I mean, depending yeah. on what the story is, how many people you need to talk to, how you end up ultimately presenting it. But like ballpark, like an, an average feature story that comes together, yeah. like Terrell, for, for example. Let's okay, just use so it, the writing. So not the research. I mean, I flew down to Laporte, Texas, and interviewed him, and doing the interviews over the phone, sending mm -hmm. out the emails to the different PR contacts or you know, trying to array, whatever, the research about the hometown. Uh, I called the Chamber of Commerce to get some info. You know, these types of all, there's all kinds of things that go into it that are time consuming. Uh, going back and watching certain plays uh, on uh, and through uh, the NFL's, uh, whatever that service is that you can go back and watch uh, old games. Um, looking up you know game books you know this this stat some trends how he compares to other players you know doing that sure part. so i had 500 words written last night already five the 500 toughest words the beginning the first 500 words were already written when i sat down at 10 10 p.m last night to write i filed to my editor at 12 this afternoon Oof. so that's 14 hours wow. of just the writing part and uh, it's uh I'm not bragging because I hate that. I wish that I could just do People are like, man, what's it like to be a writer? You must love it. I know I hate it. Yeah. I hate writing. I hate it with a passion. I let me research, let me interview, let me explore my curiosities and then pass it on to somebody else. You write it. Problem is I have to share it with everybody. My, <laughs> satisfying my curiosity is irrelevant if I don't share it. Does your brain eventually get trained though to do what like last night, what you did to write for eight, 10, 12, 14 or more hours consecutively. Like no, you ever get used to it, even no, if you don't not, like doing no, it. No, it's not like it's uh and plus I don't do it all the time. Right. I mean, I can't number one, but um, 
No, it's not like uh, being conditioned or like some sort of ad, you know, like, that's <laughs> just what I do. And, get in the gym. No, get that pen going. No. <laughs> no, it's just boring and exhausting and tedious. Yeah. And all the things, you know, one of the worst things you'd get in school, right, was get, give, me the, give me the multiple choice. Give me the true, false. Give me all that stuff, right? Yeah. Don't give me the essay or tell me to have to do the, you know, the 10 page paper, double spaced, whatever. No, everybody hated the writing <laughs> and I'm no yeah, different, even yeah. though I do it for a living. So I've known you for a long time, man, going all the way back to when you covered the Buffalo Sabres beat and you've, you know, you're a professional journalist and you've been for a long time, but today's world and we've had, uh, you know, you adjust with the times. We get older, things change. And now social media is so dominant. Yep. And I feel like now we live in a world where journalism like yours and a handful of others is the minority. If this was you cold, I'd I mean? crack into I, it. I absolutely. A hundred percent. So much of journalism, I feel You'd like, have me anyway. drooling on your podcast based on no sleep. And I, you know, and you're I just get, staring at it. I get half. It's you. only 4.9%, but I, yeah, it's a brand I, new bear too. It's just, this is a, actually the release now. I think this limited is limited edition from 26 edition. shirts. Got the 20. Are you a Pilsner? Do you like Pilsner? Are you a Pilsner guy? Yeah, that's my, that's my, that's is my it? Me too. I'm yeah. a big Pilsner guy as well. But anyways, so social media, I, I feel like journalism is just so diluted now. And it's, it's about attention and clicks now more than it's ever been. Aggregations, like, yes, my, absolutely. Like you're, my pet peeve. You're following stuff that's going on with Josh Allen. One executive apparently says he's overrated, and all this stuff's going on. Talk shows now. It's right. all about somebody says Brandon Bean's the one who's, you know, somebody, a source says it's Brandon Bean, who's the, the GM that thinks he's overrated. Just like kind of like TMZ now, but like in sports journalism, you kind of feel like it's getting like that more and more in this age of. You can put something out for attention now, and and it spreads on Twitter and it is, Facebook. It gets you through the day. It's content. Sure. It's – and I think we see – you know, for instance, I don't have a, a hot take on hot takes. Um, so you see what's happening with Stephen A. Smith and his contract negotiations with ESPN. Mm -hmm. Skip Bayless – just got dropped. Yep. Uh, he's out of work. Yep. Uh, he was the king of it as of just a couple of years ago. Yep. And now you have Stephen A. Smith, who has so much leverage because ESPN has dedicated so much of its content to Stephen A. Smith, even whether it's his show directly or indirectly, as a guest, uh, as a host, as a analyst, whatever. Like he it is, he is everywhere. And mm -hmm. if they were to lose him, do they need him? No, they don't need him. But if they were to lose him, they'd be so stuck for content yeah. he is their content and i think that that trickles down people see it people want to emulate it i don't mean stephen a specifically but just the hot take aspect of a blog of taking something you see somewhere else when i was at espn uh back from 2008 to 2011 we had a feed the beast mentality in fact that was what we had to churn out content all the time all the time now they don't do that. I would probably still, if they'd have me, I mean, I, I turned down a contract extension because I was burning out. Yeah, I remember. But if it were still, the, if, it were, if it were ESPN the way it is now, that kind of shifted when Mike Rodak was covering them, I would like to think I'd still be there because it is much closer to what we do at The Athletic now. It's not yeah. Be the Beast. It is original content. It's not aggregation. And so when you're, but, but so many other media outlets when you have so little, pay, um, excuse me, little pay, when you get paid by not necessarily the click, but the ad, whatever you need, it's still a very feed the beastie sure. type world. And so you're constantly looking for something to produce. And an argument is one of the quickest ways to get people to click on something. It's much more uh, interesting and clickable than uh, a well-researched piece that includes analytics. Yeah. Uh, now, if you have a one great, for instance, Bill Barnwell on my podcast, uh, ESPN. I meant Bill to Barnwell. mention him. Uh, that's what, see, that's what I'm talking about. Where do, you, where do you see Bill Barnwell on a Buffalo podcast? Well, I think, doesn't he do, uh, not on a podcast. I think he does some stuff with, on WGR, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, but Nick McKay, too, by the way. I don't think I have. I a, said him. He's the first one uh, I said. But um, I think that you know, so Bill Barnwell says, uh, now this would be very clear, and I'm going to clip this from my, and post it later. 
He had a couple. He had three things that I think where he talked about how Sean McDermott is taken for granted, and Bills fan, Bills fans who want him fired don't know what they're talking about or mm. don't know what they're missing uh, because they they should tap the brakes on any of that. Okay. He talked about Stefan Diggs being a smart trade because he's in the decline and had a stat from ESPN stats uh, research department that has something along the lines of getting open by pattern. And he had gone from ranking top five in the NFL the previous two or three seasons to 67th last year. Ooh. And now that's an analytic that would catch your eye, but yeah. how far does that get you? 200 right. words, right? I mean, but if, so anyway, the time, and it takes a lot of time yeah. to do pieces like that. It doesn't take much time to say, hey, did you see what so-and-so said? What do you think? And that's that then point. becomes the thing. It's ag- it's both aggregated, it's clickbaited, it's, it's the, and it's easy. It's easy. And so I think a lot of people fall into that trap. And again, that's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. If people are clicking on it, that means they like it. It serves a purpose. But I don't think it's ever going. It's I don't think it can be a career. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard to make that into a career. You have to have something much more substantive than that. We are here again at uh, the first ever Mafia Con. Del Rey, twenty six shirts. Big shout out to them. Still a lot of people here. Tim Graham is with me. We are comfortably outside here in the shade. We start winding down here in a few minutes. But again, Keon Coleman is either here or he was just here, and we've talked a little bit about. Stefan Diggs, and you just talked about what Bill Barnwell said about him uh, just a couple of minutes ago. Do you think this is a football team that is going to miss Stefan Diggs more than maybe they think they will right now? Maybe even if he was on the decline, maybe because of the attention that he still, you know, commands from defenses? So, or do you feel Pat. like it's I don't think so. But the thing is, are the fans going to miss him? Uh, and it's going to be juxtaposed with what he does in Houston. If he does well in Houston, then Bills fans might go, eh. But they've already turned on the guy. They yeah. turned on him quick, and rightfully so, with the way he left. And, you know, it's funny, though, how many fans were pushing back on me when I was mentioning, you know, the whole thing with his brother. Tray- Every time Trayvon Diggs said something, Stefan Diggs just kind of winked and, you know, let it go. Yeah. Um, you know, he never stuck up for the Bills or for Josh Allen or the city. And when I asked him about that, oh, that was too far. Like he, it became a little bit of a controversial um, moment in during the Bills season. And then Adam Benini asked some follow up questions, um, in which really got Stefan Diggs upset. Um, by the way, thank you for drafting me in your all time Bills ha! media. And I will want to say, I'm gonna not only, I, I'm not gonna be humble. First off, to make the list is impressive. I was the first first one off the board who's still doing what he does. Yes, you were everybody active, else, an active player. Everybody you're else like was LeBron. either dead or retired. Yeah, it's like MJ yeah. Bird Magic, but you're so, like LeBron. You're still out you. there hooping, man. That was nice. Adam was on your list too, I believe. Yeah. Or was he on Joe's? Um, he was on Joe's. Right. Okay, but he made the, he was yes. selected. He was yes. drafted. Yes. Um, but yeah, Stephon Diggs wore out his welcome, and it was a it's addition by subtraction. We hear the little you know, the, the read between the lines quotes from how everybody's on board this year and it's refreshing and we don't have to worry about, you know, it's, and did you notice by the way, how many of it, uh, Stefan Diggs, teammates wished him well when he left? I see many. I couldn't, I only saw one Dion Dawkins. Yeah. And Dion Dawkins has also said some kind of pointed things about Stefan Diggs and how him not being here maybe makes everybody a little more uh, happier around in the locker room and, and, and eager to pull in the same direction. Um, Do you feel fans to some extent want him to fail? I know that sounds mean. Oh, sure. You always but, do. I think especially uh, you know, when you feel first think they wanted move. Dominic Hasek to fail. Yeah. Um, I, I, it was, I mean, you, well, now we do have a Sabres discussion with the, what ha, what's been had. You wanted Ryan O'Reilly to fail. You wanted Jack Eichel to fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Panthers were a little different, I, but I'm sure that there were a lot of Sabres fans who didn't want Kyle Post. He was the captain. He's not supposed to want to leave, right? <laughs> so anyways, no, absolutely. And then what will happen is eventually they come back and, you know, so, but I don't know. Stefan Diggs, yeah, I, I, I think they're going to be fine without him, but there's not going to be, first off, Dalton Kincaid is the only Bills skill player other than Josh Allen, that you're probably going to want to like go out of your way to draft for your fantasy team 
there's no there's not going to be a superstar. You know, nah. Stefan Diggs had a relevance that he brought, you know, that uh the plays and the stats mm. and being an elite, you know, now it's spread around. And yeah. in fact, Bill Barnwell again recently ranked the Bills playmakers, not counting Josh Allen, their top five he take he rated the top five playmakers from every team and had the Bills at 24th in the NFL. Because wow. you don't know who it's going to be, and it's hard to quantify what Curtis Samuel is going to look like. Um, James Cook versus Ray Davis, Khalil Shakir versus Kia, all that stuff. So anyway, um, I I liken it to your junk drawer in your kitchen. Hmm. There's going to be something in that drawer that gets the job done. It might not be the thing that was exactly purchased to do that job, right. but there's going to be an old knife that doesn't match the rest of the silverware. There's going to be a roll of tape. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a Chinese uh, takeout menu in there. There's going to be something in there that's going to get get it done. A coin, you know, a, a dime that you're going to use to unscrew the the What an analogy. The half the half dead AAA battery. It'll <laughs> they'll they'll figure it out from there. Uh, a little bit of breaking news by the way here at Mafia Con. Remember earlier in the show when I completely threw my wife under the bus for bailing and bouncing before you even got here? She has returned. Who? Did not know my wife. Oh. <laughs> She's in there somewhere. I just seen her walk through. She waved. Um, yeah, so I threw her under the bus for not being able to take the heat, but she's she's back. I guess she heard she's that the fan. There was a bit. fan brought up. There was an industrial <laughs> fan, which I'm staring right at, at right now. And yeah, it, it helped. It helped a little bit. Who do you see on this team right now? Um, and I know we'll find out in the weeks to come. But you lose a lot of core veteran leadership. I know where they are yeah. as players. You can debate that. You know, the, a lot of these guys are on a decline. You can make a case that the Bills might ultimately be a better football team. Now we're getting into my next story. I lose into this. Are we really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to give too much of it away. I haven't written it yet. Hell, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, re I'm still but, recovering from Terrell Bernard. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you lose Poyer. You lose for, well, probably like a hide. I don't want to say for sure. What Let's yet, think about the Trey former White. captains. Yeah. Trey White. Yeah. All pro and former captain. Poyer Hyde, of course. Yep. Tyler Matikevich, special yep. teamer, Just but still a captain. Yep. Um, who Gabe else? Davis was Gabe a captain. Davis was a captain. Stephon Diggs was a captain. That's six. I want to say there were seven, but maybe just six. Anyway, six is a lot. It is it's a, a lot, lot of captains. It is. Uh, and the Bills are. Oh, Mitch Morse. Yeah. So the Bill and so these are not just captains. These are the guys who are the leaders based on the position they play. Mm -hmm. You lost Tremaine Edmonds last year. Now, of course, Terrell Bernard. Clearly, he's going to be a captain this year. Milano, whatever. I don't know. Milano. He doesn't speak. I think he grunts. <laughs> I think he grunts in code. Is that a media dream? Like. No, no, no. I think to his teammates. Oh. Like I did a I did a piece on that heading into last season. They're like, I don't know. <laughs> He's he doesn't say much to us either. Um but yeah, you're gonna have guys stepping up. Taron Johnson, of course, who's already a leader and a tone setter, but a Christian Benford. AJ Epinesa and Gregory Rousseau, mm -hmm. one or both of those guys, it's time to go. Um, Connor, uh, Mc, Connor McGovern, that one. All right, so this is where my lack of sleep was. <laughs> I said I almost said Connor McDavid, <laughs> and then caught myself so that way I could say it correctly. Connor McGovern. <laughs> so no, all these Connor or uh, Connor McGregor. I was going to say. Mm. All right, I'm 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 off the reservation now. <laughs> um, so yeah, all these guys, um, they're at center. Him playing center, that's you want a captain there. So um, yeah, these guys are going to have to emerge. One last question, then I'll let you go here. You talked. Bill Barnwell had his thoughts on Sean McDermott that he talked to about. Lots of people have their opinions on Sean McDermott. Does things stand right now going into the season? What's yours on him? What's your take on him? How much pressure is he feeling? And I'm not talking about losing his job. He's not losing his job. I mean, it would take a catastrophe yeah, I for that take, to happen. I know it wouldn't be very val – the value wouldn't be there to do it, but whether it be last year when he was the next coach to be fired on the betting line, you know, mm -hmm. you, get, you get all these emails about these prop bets, the next coach to be fired. Yeah. I would like to bet not Sean McDermott. <laughs> then he's like the fourth or fifth – most likely to be fired next coach fired on yeah. the betting lines right now. I think that's crazy. No, I mean, Terry Pagula loves him. Whether you, if you don't like Sean McDermott, tough because he's not going anywhere unless calamity mm. happens, and it's got to be 
big time calamity. Yeah. Well, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think there is some pressure on him, though. I mean, but it's just a year. And that's the thing. Because so I feel like we've been trained, we, not you, fans have been trained transition year. You know, like this might, might be, we're not trying to go backwards, but it could happen. Yeah. You know, I kind of feel like that's the mindset that they've, or the narrative that they've created for fans, whether they're buying or not. I don't know what. I think, How much pressure do you think Sean McDermott? is feeling himself I might right be, now. I might be stealing somebody's analogy and applying it that I heard somewhere else and I'm applying it to McDermott. I don't work. So I apologize if, I, but it's in my, it's been in my head for a couple of days mm -hmm. and I can't shake it because I think it's pretty good. Uh, fans who want Sean McDermott gone, I think are like a blackjack player who has a 19 against a dealer face card. And mm -hmm. you're like, Jeez, I know that dealer has twenty. I, I'm gonna. I gotta hit it. I gotta hit it. No, you don't gotta hit it. You're not supposed to hit it because you know you're gonna buy. You know yeah. who knows? I mean, we, and that's another thing I, that Barnwell and I talked about. I mean, how two teams thought Adam Gase was the answer? Cliff Kingsbury, Chip Kelly. I mean, the list of failures. I mean, you're yeah. rolling the dice. Another gambling uh, metaphor. <laughs> you're rolling the dice just cause. Just because you're just antsy. Yeah. And yeah, you, if you're convinced Sean McDermott can't get it done, all right, fine. But then you, you don't know. You yeah. still don't know what else is out there. And you don't know what's going to be better. I look forward to reading the Terrell Bernard piece coming out. Um, Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Sleep. Thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Big thanks to, again, Del Reed, 26 shirts, Punt Foundation. This was a great event here. Really good turnout. They literally sold out, like you said. Probably could have even sold more tickets. Still going pretty strong for being late in the day. But anyway, make sure you follow Tim on Twitter at by Tim Graham. And, uh, B -Y, B -Y. B -Y. B -Y, Tim Graham. And B-Y, by the way. B-I, Tim Graham is a totally different account. <laughs> Good having you on, buddy. Thanks for having me. And I'll be back with a brand new show. Anthony Marino will be joining me on Tuesday. Talk to you guys then.